Hey, look, it's showtime. It's bringing in our little from home quarantine Zoom show, True Hoop. I can never know how to say it. Um, David Thorpe is here, as is Joshua Scott Mendelson. Thank you for joining us, sir. Thank you for having me. Very excited to be here. Um, we're going to talk about your book. Actually, I'll do the first of many times I hold the book up. Um, you wrote a book about the salary cap. Um, I think you may be the only person who can say that. Is there another book about the salary cap? It's yeah, it, right? I think just, so. Yeah, yeah, okay. So he has the book about the salary cap. But David, you're here. You wrote a little story yesterday. Um, oh, there's the cap. Um, about LeBron is looking tired in fourth quarters. His production is measurably down in the fourth quarter compared to the third quarter and the first quarter, second quarter. Um, how did you do last night? So he flipped it yesterday, last night. He kind of walked through the first half and, uh, and saw his team get pulverized. And then he, he did a little bit better in the third quarter. He definitely did better in the third quarter. Uh, and the Lakers still got beat up. And then he was fantastic in the fourth quarter. They went to kind of a, 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 a different aggressive zone look. The Lakers were down 18 at one point, made it a, a three-point game, uh, and blew an easy uh, Anthony Davis dunk that would have even done better. And so ended up with 30 points, I think 20 in the second half. But um, uh, it wasn't enough because Anthony Davis was exhausted. And uh, the Lakers need both guys to play really well. Denver played very well. A couple of other quick things. The, the Lakers, who, who really played Denver about even in the paint in game one, which was a surprise. Both teams scored a lot. And got outplayed in the paint in game two, which is even more a surprise. They reasserted their dominance yesterday and destroyed the Nuggets inside, but shot terribly, which they are capable of doing. We've seen this before. And, they, and, and it was a difference in the game. They just shot really badly. The question is going to be, can LeB LeBron needs to play four good quarters to ensure the better team wins. I don't know if he can do that. And Anthony Davis looked exhausted, and they're playing again tomorrow night with no break. It's a series. Uh, Denver, Denver looked confident. Jeremy Grant was one of the best players on the court. There's no third Laker that you can say that about. It's a two-man team, which I always thought it would be. But there's, there's reason for to be concerned if you're a Lakers fan. Um, that was a weird I, – I didn't have time to look this up. but or even, Actually, I'm not totally sure how to look it up, to be honest. But um, both teams had giant scoring droughts in that game. Like, I think the Nuggets were on 99 for like half an hour, it seemed like. Or this, and the Lakers had a similar deal. Um, it just struck him. Like, I wonder if the Warriors ever had a scoring drought like that. I mean, they're definitely a better offensive team than either of those two teams. The Way Warriors, better. Yeah. yeah. But they just, they have, what, well, like I just said, the, the Lakers offense ends with Davis and LeBron. Let's just be clear. Not that the other guys can't make shots. They didn't last night. Caruso and Rondo particularly, I think, were 0 of 7 combined. But the, so the Warriors had Durant and Curry in their best version and then they had Clay Thompson, one of the league's best shooters, as the third guy, and Draymond, a great facilitator, right? And and Sean Livingston could make plays. He always could make plays, even as a scorer. So, uh, and their offense was better. Although I will say that I know we want to, I want to talk to Josh about the cap as much as you do, but the Lakers are not running Milwaukee's offense. They're yeah. definitely running stuff. Denver for sure is, but and I give Vogel credit for that. They defend with passion and purpose. And they're running stuff. They're not just clearing out for LeBron, uh, uh, often anyway. They, obviously, they do have some. And that's one reason why they're, they're very good. They're running better stuff. They really are. Yeah. They just you done that thing them. where it's like Jeremy, like Rondo, Jeremy Grant, all, all these players are not really lights out shooters. They're not excited to catch and shoot, right? Like, and that what you didn't see the Warriors do was like, you know, the Jeremy Grant or Rondo figure would catch it, like wait, <laughs> look to pass, like, maybe make a little move then not find anything better and shoot it like we all know that one's not going in at the same rate as if you just want to shoot it when you catch decisiveness it decisiveness is a big factor i don't think it's as much a factor as what people will say but it is it is certainly a factor uh at rondo i thought was bad last night and he was yeah. very good in other parts of the previous two games so i, I still think lakers are, are likely to win the series but i don't feel as good as i did when i picked them to win in four or five games a week ago because I just don't see LeBron giving 48 minutes. He's, he just isn't. The facts are the facts. He had been great in the first half almost every game previous to this, and this time it just flipped. The second half was better. 
but he needs to play closer to like 44 minutes or 42 minutes of, of really good basketball. He's not even close to that right now. He's not even playing that much because they're, he needs to rest more. So it's a scary situation for Laker fans. Josh, are you an NBA fan? <laughs> yes. Uh, I you have a, a team? I am a, I'm a Knicks fan, but I've been a Brooklyn Nets season ticket holder since they oh, wow. were in Newark. Okay. It was, I, I worked in Newark at the time. It cost $300 to get season tickets for the Prudential Center. And then every year the Nets have been so odd that we're able to continue to have, like, the best deal in, in the arena. So I do love Sean Livingston. Sean Livingston was my favorite Net. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, great guy. Um, okay, so um, you are a labor lawyer with extensive experience in sports, entertainment, and broadcasting, and an adjunct professor at the Benjamin N. Cardozo School of Law teaching collective bargaining and sports entertainment. You live in New York. And um, you, at some point, something happened in your life where you were like, I know, I'm going to write a book about the NBA salary <laughs> cap. Like, how does that, what happened? Did you get hit in the head or something? No. I, so I, I've loved the NBA my whole life. I love baseball and I love the NBA. And I mean, I wrote about it a bit in the book, like at the very beginning, which is that it actually started when Omar Ashik went from the Bulls to the Rockets. Oh, yeah, right? classic. And, and, yeah, and so I remember when he signed that deal, I was like, Daryl Moore is really smart. And Bob Ryan was on Around the Horn, and it was basically like, Moses Malone had more interesting things in his deal 30 years ago. And I had no idea what he was talking about. And then, you know, there was something, I think Harry Arden, what, Harvey Arden went on um, Woj's podcast and was talking about, like, you know, what happened in the late 80s and that Brian Shaw went to Italy, like all of these things that I didn't know anything about. And I realized that there wasn't a book on any of this stuff. You know, yeah. baseball, you have the Lords of the Realm, you have Marvin Miller's book, you have all of these histories, you have Moneyball, you have all these histories of the economics of the sport. And in basketball, there just wasn't one. And the more I dug into it, and the more that I liked it, um, the more I kind of learned that it was super interesting and super fascinating. And I found that Larry Fleischer, who was, you know, the Michelle Roberts, the head of the union for 27 years, who has now that been really good looking guy. Exactly. Yeah. 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 It, it, it's not the most uh, favorable picture <laughs> of him, but was, was an incredibly creative and innovative and influential person in sports. And it's been totally forgotten, totally, yeah. totally off the face of the earth. And so um, I started to research it and then it started to come together and then, I found a ton of internal NBA documents that kind of made the book much more kind of an insider circumstance than I had even hoped for it to be. I, I, so I've read like 20 pages here and 20 pages there. So I have a like deep knowledge of a couple of episodes. Um, but my first takeaway is like, there are these, it feels like you're in the room. They're like incredible insidery behind the scenes, like, like uh, suspenseful scenes, which are just hats off to you. I, it's not easy to make that level of like my heart was racing while reading a your book about the cap. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> well, the, the, the other goal that I had was I wanted to make sure that it wasn't kind of a straightforward, and then the union proposed 2.7%, and the league came back with 2.3%. Like, that's not, what, that's not what these negotiations were, right? You have, you have and, that's not, and that's not the history either, right? Because it's not just about this, these negotiations in a vacuum. It's about, you know, kind of the, the rise of the NBPA, the nature of player activism in the 60s and 70s, the ABA-NBA merger, the Oscar Robertson case, and how that bleeds into it. So, it, you know, you could have written a pretty dry book, but I, I didn't have to because there was so much else that was going on there. Um, so can I ask you to tell us some of the anecdotes from the book? Like, I, in, maybe start with the Donald Sterling. I, I just didn't know. Everybody knows he got kicked out of the NBA. I only learned from your book he got kicked out of the NBA twice and just... <laughs> <laughs> refused to leave the first time. Unbelievable move. Like a um, Seinfeld episode. Yeah. So, so one, of, one of the aspects that I found to be very interesting is that the owners who ran, who owned NBA teams in the early 80s, and one of my friends used this term when I talked with him the other day, is they're charlatans, right? That's the only word you can use to describe these guys. And so Donald Sterling buys into the NBA in 1981. He puts up $99,000 on a $13 million <laughs> team. And I'll tell you that because I have the internal document that reflects it. And so he buys in, he buys in, he buys into the team and the NBA had to take whoever could buy it, whoever, whoever was interested in it. You know, I know I, we might talk about Ted Stepien or some of these other kind of, you know, uh, silly owners, but Sterling buys in and he, you know, he gives this, he buys and he gives this, this interview to the LA times and they describe how he's drinking white wine out of a styrofoam cup in the middle of the interview. 
And, you know, he's saying- They should have how- kicked him out right then. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, he's saying how he doesn't like the permissiveness of LA, that he's really more of a military San Diego, because they were the San Diego Clippers at the time. And, but basically, almost from the minute he comes in, he's having issues in terms of not investing in the team or making it about him. But then he's also not doing very basic things of owning the team, right? So he's not, he's not paying people. He's not uh, uh, complying with the obligations that he has. At one point, I mean, he almost caused a wildcat strike in the NBA in, 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 during the All-Star break of 1982 because he just, he owed money and he was like, I'm just not going to pay it. Um, and, and, you know, there's kind of a, you know, basically Russ Granick, who was the general counsel of the NBA at the time, but then became the, the um, deputy commissioner um mm-hmm. he's the second round of the draft when i was a kid and so um you know you know uh, but but he, he basically is like i can't put forward the arguments that sterling wants me to put forth because it's unethical for me to say you know these types of things and so basically in the summer of 82 he says that he makes a deal to move the team from san diego to la and he doesn't tell anybody he doesn't get permission from the league he doesn't get permission from anybody and so when they converge on the owners meeting which is both about about trying to finalize their proposals, trying to put forward this proposal about what the salary cap looks like. It's also them going into court to try to stop Stern for, uh, to stop Sterling from being able to do it. Uh, and then a couple of months later, they basically, you know, kind of issue a, a, a edict that they want him to, to leave. Um, and there's kind of a quote in there where, you know, Sterling is uh, working diligently to find someone to take over the team, but it's going to take a heck of a long time. And then he doesn't leave for another 30 years. So <laughs> it's uh it's 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 certainly interesting. So they they put together this like six person committee to sort of investigate what they should do and they were unanimous to one kick him out. Did that committee just have no teeth? So and it was funny cuz we talked about this a bit before and I looked into it and I looked into what I had. I mean basically they it seems like a few months later um so a guy named Alan Rothenberg who I guess the best way to think of him is kind of like Think of like when, when, when Adam Silver put Jerry Colangelo in charge of the Sixers. That was kind of what they did. Um, and, you know, nothing about that particular circumstance. But it kind of seemed like, you know, this was a guy who had negotiated their TV deal. He had negotiated the CBA in 1980. And then he kind of comes in and he's taken over the Clippers and he's working with them. And sometimes, you know, they're kind of saying that this is really, you know, there are notes between them and Larry O'Brien, the commissioner of the NBA, saying, hey, this is, this is really putting a stranglehold on our franchise. We can't succeed. And then it seems like it kind of petered away for a bit. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I want to just be clear, Josh. When when you use the the term charlatan, it, does that a charlatan is to my knowledge is someone who boasts that they're being called a charlatan, but <laughs> they're happy to be called that. It's the nicest thing I've heard say about an owner on this show in a long time. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's funny because like they, you know, and I, I wrote about it a big a bit in the book. Like, you know, the. the the heroes in the well, the heroes in the book are often the players, right? The players had to have were, were the guys who ran the union during this period, right? Tommy Heinsohn, Oscar Robertson, Paul Silas, wow. Bob Lanier extensively. There's a lot about Bob Lanier. These guys were men of tremendous leadership and tremendous character and tremendous integrity, right? They were who you want running your organization. The owners were not really the same exact way, and so many of these, you know, some of these guys, you know. Fleischer made a joke that like they, they, they're cycling in and out right so over the course of like the 70s to the 80s you're going through I don't remember the exact number it's in the book I think it was something like you know every team had turned over two or three times in like a five-year period right both the Rockets and the Celtics had five or six different owners within within a 10-year period so they, these guys would come in they'd want to be in the news for two years and then it would kind of peter out and they would be gone and that was kind of the way that it isn't the same. It isn't the same thing as it is now. It wasn't seen as the uh, the kind of investment that it is now. Uh, no, it was not. No, um, no TV deal at all. I guess we should just get right to the um, the Cavaliers Ted Stepien situation. I know that there are a lot of stories about him, but he the part I remember is like they were team was just so terrible they had to make a rule to prevent other owners from being as terrible as he'd been. Well, I mean, <clears throat> and there's a lot about Stepien. Stepien basically built this this company and kind of all of the uh which i wrote about a bit in the book is every description that you read about ted stepien um is that he was somewhat successful in spite of himself uh another owner described him as someone who thinks with their mouth open uh (laughs) and so when he goes to buy the cavaliers there's a big issue because he has this bad history of making racist and anti-semitic comments when he tried to buy 
the, the Cavaliers and the Indians. He, um, and, and we go through a bit of that. And the problem was, is that when, when they, you know, several of the Cavs said they didn't want to play for him. He said that he, he, um, you know, and, and, and he kind of defended himself. And, and I talk about a bit of that in the book, but by the time they bring him in, um, they're basically questioning him about these issues and they're not questioning him about kind of his finances. And so, uh, you know, and, and the, 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 the quotes from, from, um, from his kind of owner's meetings are quite interesting. And a lot of that is in there as well. And he kind of takes over the team uh, and he makes sure that, um, you know, he can run the basketball operations. He had no experience running the basketball operations. He hired a GM who, um, had been out of the league for four years. And when they brought his like press conference, they described him as someone uh, who had gone to more San Diego Padres games than anybody else in the history of the world the previous year. And he basically had gotten the job by getting Billy Martin to flatter the owner of the Cavaliers to hire him. Uh, and he, be sorry, he became the coach and the GM was the GM of, of Ted Stepien's um, softball team that he owned. So this, these were not real professionals. And then they, he then proceeded to trade every single player uh, he traded away every draft pick uh, for the next, you know, 10 years. The joke was that their next first round pick was in seventh grade at the time. Um, <laughs> and then there was also a point in the NBA where the, um, uh, the rules changed and you could kind of sign free agents for, for um, a considerable amount. And Ted Stepien then went out and signed every single player he could find. He signed bench players to these very, very high salaries, um, which then massively inflated the salary scale. Um, and so, uh, you know, it was, he basically, and he also spent a tremendous amount of money as well. You know, this isn't a circumstance where kind of you have, uh, owners in small markets who are unwilling to spend. He was someone who was spending two or three times the, and it's reflected in, in the internal NBA economic documents that he's spending two or three times what the team was actually worth to try to sign these guys. And so, you know, they're trying, they want him out. They want owners like him out. They want to be able to have, um, better people in, uh, and so, yeah, so eventually, you know, part of, you know, during the negotiations, he's trying to sell the team. He's trying to move the team to Toronto or to Louisville. They're trying to move it all over the place. Uh, they can't, you know, they can't do it. Don King at one point steps up and says he wants to buy the Cavaliers. Uh, and then, you know, not long after they reach the deal on, on, on the salary cap, um, a couple of weeks later, Stepien's out and Gordon Gunn, who then ran the Cavaliers for, for several decades, comes in. Um, so, yeah. and at some point he writes a letter like to the commissioner I'm paraphrasing terribly and you can but basically it's like okay I'll take a bunch of draft picks <laughs> I'm sorry I, I forgot about this so there's a couple of hysterical points where Ted Stepien is running a team and they're doing terribly and basically the league steps in and says you have to stop trading now that if you want to make a trade you have to come to us first before we'll agree to have you do it and so the NBA, the, the guy who's the director of operations for the NBA, has to tell every other team that if you want to make a trade with the Cavaliers, you have to, it has to run through me. Ted Stepien goes crazy that O'Brien goes public, that they went public about like this thing that he was under. Um, and so then, yeah, at the end, when he's trying to get, he's like, you know what, you know, I, I was too proud. Uh, and I quote this in the book, the idea came from the owner of the Celtics. He said, I was too proud, but now can I please have a million draft picks so I can rebuild my friend? <laughs> So this is the reason why Chris Paul couldn't be traded to the uh, Lakers. That is yeah. that is where the Stepien rule came from. Um, uh, yeah, I mean it, it, it's uh, it's very funny. I mean it's, it's not amazing. funny. He was, an idiot. he was a jerk, but you know. Um, oh, he was a jerk too. He was a. Well, bad I mean, he character. was. He, you know, he was. He was. He he made a bunch of racist and anti-Semitic comments that you oh. know uh, are not. You know. He he was not he was not the greatest guy in the world. Um, well, he did every sort of, single roster construction thing that you can do, right? Each one of those is a fatal flaw. Softball manager, rookie coach, um, spending all the money, trading all the draft picks, no talent evaluation. Like, you could get any one of those, you're doomed. He had all five. Like, that's amazing. It's true. It's true. Uh, and, and he didn't like black people or Jews either? No, he did not. He also ended up suing the radio broadcaster that broadcast the games because he didn't like that they were critical of him. So he ended up suing the radio broadcast partner of the Cleveland Cavaliers because he didn't like what they were saying. That would never happen now because they would never be critical of the owner. <laughs> oh, God, no. <laughs> yeah. um, wow, that's amazing. Um, now maybe we could talk about uh, Moses Malone was in line to become maybe the richest player in team sports history, and he was negotiating with 
uh, the well, we all know the Maloofs as the owners of the Kings, but their dad was the owner of the Rockets at the time. Can you tell us about that? Sure. So one of the issues that was going on as they're having these negotiations was that the NBA was saying several things at the same time, right? They're saying we're running out of money and we're going to go under. They're saying that the fans are there and it just needs to grow and get there. And, you know, the other issue is that teams would never be able to stop themselves from signing people, right? So Moses Malone is a free agent in 1982. He is 28 years old. He is the reigning MVP. Um, he is probably, if, if not, you know, Magic is a rookie and Dr. J is still there and Larry Bird is there, but probably the best player in the NBA. Yeah. And he is what every single team wants, right? The year before he's a free agent, Jerry Buss gets in trouble because he's saying, I want to sign Moses Malone. And he gets in trouble both with the league for tampering and with Kareem because he's going after a player while Kareem is still the star of the Lakers. And so, so, but Moses was playing for the Rockets and he didn't want to go anywhere. Um, he had tried to stay there. He had wanted to stay there. And so he, he's in negotiations. His agent um, was a guy named Lee Fentress, who um, was the founder of what became ProServe, which then became where David Falk came from. And so uh, he's negotiating. They think they have a deal. The owner who's the father of uh, 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 Maloof dies. Um, his son, who is, I believe, 24 at the time, who's Gavin, takes over, says that his father's last words were, how many points did Moses score last night? He takes over. He's younger than nine of the 12 players on the team. And it appears, based on, on, on you know, kind of what happened, is that his focal point went from being a little bit more on public relations than on running the team. And so he starts doing a lot of press interviews. And the, the, the funny thing that he says is, you know, he's talking about um, you know, how, what, what to bring the NBA into the future, right? So the idea is that the NBA is, they know it's there. They know the roots of a successful league are there, but ratings are down and attendance is down and they're not sure what's going to happen. And so he says, well, you know what, you know, the, 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 the NFL has a Super Bowl, right? Major League Baseball has the World Series. The NHL has a Stanley Cup Finals. The NBA needs something to call its championship game. And his great idea for calling the finals is to call it the round bowl which I found to be not the most, you know, desirable. But basically what ends up happening is he says he doesn't end up negotiating with Malone. Malone, right before he becomes a free agent, uh, 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 Malouf says, you know, I'm going to sign him. I'm going to make him the highest paid player. Around the same time, he then sells the team to someone else. So now we have a third owner in the last uh, 15 months. They try to lowball him. Uh, and then Moses Malone ends up kind of out there, right? He kind of ends up out there at sea. No one's signing him. It's not clear whether it's collusive. There seemed to be some indication that there were some pretty uh, strong pushes not to sign him. Uh, meanwhile, you have the, the Philadelphia 76ers who have been to three titles in the previous six years. Their owner is a guy named Harold Katz who built the Nutrisystem uh, diet empire. Um, and he basically was a very flamboyant owner. Um, he used to travel with the team. He'd be involved in timeouts. He used to talk about how he had guarded or he played against Wilt Chamberlain when he scored 100 points. And so he basically, he, he had said about a week earlier that, you know, there's no money in the NBA. There's nothing we can do. He traded Daryl Dawkins to get one of Stepien's draft picks. And then he has the opportunity to sign Moses Malone, right? And he can bring the, you know, this is a team that has Dr. J that had gone to the finals the previous year and lost to the Lakers and kind of all of his financial uh, uh, puritanism goes out the window because he can sign Moses Malone. And so then he signs Moses Malone to the biggest contract in the history of the NBA. Uh, and when they ask him about, you know, kind of his financial discipline, he says, well, you know, I'd, I'd, uh, I'd rather lose a few dollars and win than make a few dollars and lose. And so that's kind of how Moses Malone ended up on the Sixers, and then they end up going. Was there a cap then? No. No. So no what there, went. But what it was there, coming. Yeah. Well, no, no, no. What there, what there was was so, – so, and, <clears throat> and I apologize if I'm getting a little too nerdy in terms of the nature of how – No, it, don't go all the way in. Okay. Yeah, get nerdy. It's fine. So, so, so basically, um, in, in, in night, you know, the, 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 the Players Association, when the ABA and the NBA are about to merge – right? The ABA is driving up salaries in the NBA, uh, and they're about to merge. And so Larry Fleischer, Oscar Robertson, Willis Reed, Bill Bradley, and Kevin Lockery have a press conference in the middle of the Eastern Conference Finals to say, we are suing the NBA as an unlawful combination or strength of trade, violating the antitrust law, and that everything that exists, the draft, all of these things are violate the law. You cannot allow the ABA and the NBA to merge, okay? This is 
audacious, right? This is an incredibly aggressive thing. You, and you have the stars of the league, right? You have Oscar, you have Bill Bradley. In the conference finals in a year when the Knicks win the title, you know, going out publicly that they're going to sue the league. Within a few weeks, they get an injunction that they can't merge unless they get the agreement of the players. So for six years, the ABA and the NBA are driving up salaries. Salaries are going up, right? It went from the, the, the median salary to be 35,000 in 1970 to 100,000 in 1976, which is, a, a, it might've been more, I don't remember. You might, don't quote me on that, it's in the book, right? <laughs> but then in, 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 they're gonna win. They're, you know, basically what ends up happening is the NBA owners, the NBA owners are trying to, to um, drive out the deal. Right, they're trying to trying to wait out the players. They're trying to drive up the cost so much, and this is this is the the strategy of David Stern, of of um, uh, Jay Walter uh, uh, Kennedy, who was the previous commissioner, and then Larry O'Brien, who was the commissioner of the NBA when they settled. Right, and then the, Larry O'Brien Larry O'Brien comes in and they make a deal. Right, and the deal is that basically um, for five years they're going to have what's called compensation. For five years, they're going to have the right of first refusal, which is restricted free agency. They called it an experiment. And then there was going to be free agency, right? There was going to be unbridled free agency in, in, in 1987, right? And so what ends up happening between seven, you know, and, and one of the things is, and David Halberstam wrote about this in Breaks of the Game. I didn't write about this. He did. But, you know, Fleischer is negotiating this deal. They didn't want to agree to compensation. Compensation is basically a circumstance where if, if one team signs, if, if, um, uh, 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 Kawhi Leonard goes from the Raptors to the Clippers. What do the Raptors get as compensation for Kawhi Leonard going? Right. That was the nature of it. And the players didn't want to agree. And so what they agreed to was that they would do it for five years. And the reason why they did that was, um, you know, there they've been this case is going on for six years. One of the players turns to Fleischer and says, "Well, how long would it take for this to get to the Supreme Court?" Fleischer says, "I don't know. About probably about five years." So the player goes, "Well, why not just give them this for five years and then it goes away?" Right. And that's basically what they did. Um, and then Fleischer, who was a brilliant attorney, truly, and I didn't know much about him before I started this. He's a brilliant guy. And he was also an agent, which at first I thought was sketchy. But now I find to be an interesting dynamic because what he did was he agreed to this compensation system. And then he spent five years attacking the loopholes of it and extending it. And they would go to these cases before the special master who was overseeing, you know, David Stern and Larry O'Brien would have these very heavy handed compensation decisions, right? If you want to sign Bill Walton, we're going to gut your entire team, right? You want to sign Marvin Webster to, to, to another team, we're going to gut your entire team. But Fleischer had a, a third party, a, a judge who was overseeing these decisions, and he won every single case. Now, allegedly, the special master was also a squash player with flight. That was part of the reason why they did so well before him. But they're dragging this out over, you know, and so he wins every single case, allegedly. I don't know if it's every single case. That's what I was told. That's what I believe, right? So by 1981, the owners don't want this system anymore. They don't want this thing that they thought was going to be their savior of the system. They don't want it anymore because it's bad. Now, keep in mind, baseball then went, they had a strike over this in 1981. That's a different story. We can talk about the comparative relationships between baseball and basketball and football if you want, because it's another part of the book. All of which to say that there was no salary cap, but that there was that system and then restricted free agency in 1981, um, which was a bit different than restricted free agency now, only because there was not a cold market. So it wasn't a circumstance where, you know, unless you kind of have, you know, I don't know, the Nets giving Otto Porter a max deal that wasn't out there if someone else was, you had circumstances in which teams tried to use restricted free agency more aggressively than I think they do now. And I think that that was only for a couple of years. So by the time, you know, Moses Malone's up there, it was the, the, the and I apologize, I went very far afield and I didn't really answer your question. No, I like but, it. But the, 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 the um, Rockets had an ability to match the offer that, um, that Moses signed. And so what ended up happening was that, and this is while, and there's kind of a legal battle at the beginning of the book, but while they're, they're doing this, you have Larry Fleischer and Harold Katz, the owner of the Sixers, fighting together to make sure that Moses' contract holds up. And you have Stern and the owners and the Rockets trying to knock out all of these proposals in Malone's contract. Because they had benefits of, if the team wins, you get X dollars. All of these things that would never exist now, right? They had all of these specific elements of his contract that are very interesting. Um, and so you had the union fighting with the team to try and expand it and you had the league trying to hold it back. 
We've done over 80 shows, Henry, and that's the first Otto Porter reference. So thank you, Josh, for, that. <laughs> for, our, for our Otto Porter fans. Um, so then they, Larry Fleischer does uh, get everyone to agree on this idea of a cap. And then there's this moment of having to evaluate, to, to evaluate all revenue, which is this, and this is where I thought that was, a, it's an amazing thing to even attempt. Um, and he was a CPA, which suddenly matters. Can you talk about this? Sure. So one of the things that I found very interesting about going through going through these negotiations is that I had kind of oh, there's kind of this um, ethereal fairy tale, not fairy tale, but story about these negotiations, which is that the NBA was struggling. They opened the books and the players agreed to a cap. Now, as a as a labor lawyer, I had kind of always assumed or believed that it was going to be the owners kind of shoving it down the players' throats and not anything that they would ever want to be a part of it. And when you dig in on it, you look at the negotiations back and forth. First of all, there were a lot of things that the players did want and did get. Um, but also that Larry Fleischer was in a specific ability to be able to evaluate this and, and analyze this because he wasn't, he wasn't like me. He was kind of a traditional labor lawyer, right? He kind of came into this existence by virtue of the fact that someone he knew, you know, asked him to help the Celtics with kind of building this union, building this circumstance. He was a CPA, he was a tax attorney, and he was a lawyer. And so he kind of looked for loopholes, or he looked for these circumstances, and he was able to kind of, he was in a specific, specifically beneficial position to look at, okay, if we're going to do this revenue, and we're going to do this kind of revenue share, to be able to evaluate the specifics of the economic circumstances of all the teams, and then to figure out what was going on. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that the idea of a revenue share uh, came from the NFLPA. It didn't come, it wasn't kind of this thing that all owners had always wanted from the beginning of time. It was a proposal that came from the NFLPA, from Ed Garvey and the NFLPA, the year before as part of their negotiations that they weren't able to achieve, that the NFL said, we'll never agree to this in a million years. We hate it and the players went on strike over it. Um, but the idea was that, you know, you have to try to figure out one, right, from Fleischer's perspective, he wants to make sure that they're getting everything, specifically television. Right. So television was the key part of what the NBA players wanted. It was something that he had been going after for about 15 years. Um, and it was something by virtue of the fact both of the, the he wanted a percentage of the television revenues, but he all cable was just bubbling up at this time. Uh, and the NBA had also, you know, this is, I might be getting a little far afield, um, but the NBA had also filed a lawsuit in the late 1970s that by virtue of putting players images on cable, right. They were, um, the players had a right to the use of their likeness, yeah, right? right? And so they sued them in 1979 and said, if you want, this was against MSG, if you want to put them on the air, we have a right to our likeness. And this was something where, you know, the, the lawyer for the union, a guy named Jim Quinn, and uh, told me that they believe that this case was BS, right? But if you look at the internal NBA documents, they were petrified. They were petrified that the union was actually going to win this and have the right to get all of this revenue. And so, um, you know, Fleischer is trying to value that. He's trying to value um, how the owners interact with one another. So one of the issues was is that Jerry Buss owns the Lakers, he owns the Kings, and he owns the Four, right? How do you, how do you allocate that money? If you're trying to find what, what related income is, how do you evaluate that money? And so there's a lot of kind of back and forth in terms of trying to figure out what that is, how that would work. And the truth of the matter is, is that they, they're negotiating this in a very condensed time frame. Right, so the NBA turns over the documents in November of 1982. Um, the players spend about two months. They hire CPAs and accountants are looking through it. They have cable projections, and so between January and April 2nd, which was the players' strike deadline, the players issue a strike deadline. They have to negotiate this incredibly complex agreement, and it's incredible that they were able to do it. So at one point during negotiations, you know, about you know, I don't know, maybe it was a month before the strike was supposed to take place. You know, Fleischer puts forward an incredibly complicated agreement, right? They issue a strike date at the All-Star Game in February. The strike date is April 2nd. You know, Fleischer puts across a deal that is close, is moving things forward. And, and Stern basically says, you got some nerve coming in three weeks before a strike and saying, you want to give us a, an incredibly complicated proposal with all of these different tentacles that we have to go and figure out. And so, it was, you know, all of us say it was incredibly complicated um, and, 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 and fascinating negotiation. And I don't, I don't envy his ability to try to figure out what all revenue meant or how that would work. What, what was the break? What was the ratio generally speaking compared to now, like in terms of how owners and players are sharing? So 
here's the thing, okay? So in what they agreed to in 82, 83, okay? And they're very different animals, right? So it's, it's hard to say exactly. And because it also depends on how you define basketball-related income. And so what happened in 82, 83 was they agreed to 53%. But they also, there was no max salary. There was no luxury tax. Uh, there was no rookie wage scale. Um, and, and, you know, at the very end of the book, you know, I talk about how Fleischer was very good at finding loopholes and of expanding. And so at the very end, you could, you know, the way, that the, the way that it worked out is you could sign all your players, right? And because of the Larry Bird rule, which is something that happened in the original negotiations, you could sign your player to whatever, whatever you wanted. So the salary cap kind of became meaningless. So within a, within a year, I think there was a meeting. When it first went into effect, I think the players were at 61% of wow. revenue sometime in, in around 84, 85. And now it's around 50, 51. Yeah. I don't know how the escrow works and all of that works. But that kind of depends. It's just a very different universe. Um, and I think... <laughs> Yeah. Who's getting screwed more then compared to now, would you say? I, I realize in negotiation, you're trying to get everyone at least somewhat happy, but who do you think had the bigger advantage then compared to now? Well, I mean, I think, I think then, look, I think, I think here is the thing, right? Fleischer had the, 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 the Robertson case over his shoulder for the next five years, right? He didn't have to agree to it. Right? right. And there's kind of a court decision in where they basically say that the NBA could propose it, but they couldn't implement it. They couldn't force it on the players. So he had, he had a good amount of leverage in those negotiations. Um, now is a bit different. You know, I, I think. So I think just to clarify that, like the Oscar, can you just explain what you mean? Like the, the Robertson, the Supreme Court had decided the Robertson case, which conceivably meant that the NBA could not have a salary cap is what you're saying. No. So what happened was that in, sorry, um, the, the, the Oscar Robertson case had a, it never actually went to a decision. They reached a settlement, okay. right? Okay. And so the settlement was for 10 years, right? We have five years of compensation and five years of restricted free agency, right? And then everyone's back, right? We can, we, you know, because all of this stuff violates antitrust law. Now the law is, the, the stuff has shifted. It is obvious, right? And I, I, you know, whatever it is. Um, and so what, what the decision, but part of that agreement was that there would be a federal court overseeing the complicated agreement that they had to make sure that everyone complied with it. And so it was basically that players could, could achieve as high a salary as they could and that owners could not try not to, to stop it. And so, you know, and you will see in these negotiations, Fleischer will quote, will quote that line over and over and over again to Stern, kind of pushing it in his face that like, you know, under the Robertson case, players can do whatever they're going to do. And so um, that, that was the thing. So they had that comfort that for another five years after they reached this agreement, they would still be going to, to the, the special master. And even after that, there was, there was um, the Junior Bridgman case. It was still overseen by a special master, but that was somewhat of a different story. But um, yeah, so. Um, so this question of like, what are the league's revenues um, never gets simple, right? Um, you know, and, and my friend Kevin Arnovitz wrote a story a little while ago about, he's, I think it's called like the MBAs or real estate business now. And he's talking about, the amount of dollars in real estate around stadiums, right? So, um, you know, like the the Warriors have, I think, a one point six billion dollar stadium, but they also have a million buildings around it, office park, blah blah blah, condos, like, and so if you're the owner of the Warriors, like a benefit of your position is this real estate revenue, um, which you wouldn't have otherwise. But is it basketball related income? Do the players deserve a cut of that? Like this just never gets simple because that's pretty standard that's what that's what owners are looking to do in, in all sports all the time yeah uh, and even img when they built their facility it was really a, a real estate business we're gonna bring all these athletes here and sell their the families of the kids the surrounding condos and houses whatever it was a real estate play so yeah how do you what, how do you how do they do that they don't count that as basketball income do they i mean look they they could right and i think look i think part of it is is that and look I, I don't know the framework of what, what the, the, the labor relationship is between the NBA and the NBPA. And, you know, I think it's always easy to look at someone else's agreement and be like, you should have done this, you should have done that, you should have done this, you should have done that. And I think that every agreement is, is the outgrowth of what, what the parties ended up negotiating. Um, but it would seem to me that I think that part of, part of what Fleischer did, which was smart, was that he said, well, I don't know, maybe we shouldn't have access to this, but I'm going to go for it, right? And so, you know, I mean, the, 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 
part part of what happened in the book and part of what I, I found is that you know baseball and basketball made two different bets, right? Baseball was owners can never stop themselves from signing players, and that we want the free market to ride as high as we can. And that was a reasonable, that was a reasonable bet, right? So the, the baseball players didn't have a guaranteed percentage of revenue, but they believed that the market would would act as an engine for itself, right? Basketball, Fleischer said, we want a guaranteed percentage of revenue for a number of reasons. One, because we think TV is going to boom. Two, we don't trust the owners not to spend. Right. I mean, the problem was that you had people like Stepien and Sterling, and, and you also had these ABA franchises who were really squeezed. The ABA-NBA merger was a squeeze of the yeah. ABA teams. And so the NBA said, okay, well, we want a percentage of your revenue and what that counts for. And I do not know what's in the current agreement. In, in what Fleischer agreed to is that it says we want all, all sources of revenue known or unknown, right? Which is language as a labor lawyer you want to have because you want to get, you want to be able to go in front of an arbitrator and say, this real estate deal is yeah. signed by, Ver you know, oh, you don't think it is? Well, then we, we're requesting all of the documents that reflect what was agreed to, you know? And that's something that if that's part of your agreement as the union, you can ask for. So, um, you know, I, I think that, I, you know, I think that, that it depends on the nature of the relationship and the circumstances, but I think it's something reasonable to, to look at or, or to think about. Yeah. Um, and then I have to ask you about this because it's like a pet project of mine, but uh, about this time, Adnan Khashoggi almost bought the jazz. I think it was 84, which that one illuminates the notion that there might be reasons to own a team beyond loving basketball, <laughs> right? Where, you know, it's probably the potential for some kind of money laundering or reputation laundering happening there. Um, another value of owning a team that's hard to put in a CBA. Yeah, I mean, here's the thing, okay? The union has no control over who is on the other side of the table, right? You have, the, the, the union can't say, you know what, I hate David Stern, get rid of David Stern, replace him with someone I like, right? You have no control over who is on the other side of the table. You have no control over how ownership interacts with one another. I think the part of what, part of the problem that existed before was that these teams were little fiefdoms, right? They, they didn't even have to, they didn't have to tell each other how much money they made. They didn't have to show each other audited financials. So one of the things that we talked about in terms of Sterling early on is that when the NBA did its investigation, they were unable to get the, you know, there, there's notes in their, in their report that says like, we didn't see their audited financials, right? When they would prepare for bargaining, they would like have voluntary requests from teams to comply. And so when you, when, you know, this is probably better, possibly better for the union, probably better for, it's probably better for, for ownership is that, you were now, because of the virtue of the revenue share, because of that circumstance, they had to share with each other. They had to tell mm -hmm. each other what was going on. Like before this, you had, you know, there was a mantra that Stern would say that like every team is responsible for its own obligations. He kept saying this over and over and over again. And by virtue of that, you know, you, you know, I think it would make it harder. It would make it, it would, look, it wouldn't make it harder for someone to use the NBA and to use their team as an ancillary mechanism to move money it would make it harder for them to do so in such a way as to tank the league. Let me put it that way. I got you. I got you. Um, there's a funny, I don't know if this is still true, but at one point a pretty plugged in guy told me that like dissecting the Nick. So now they have a system where every team has to turn over its audited financials and there's a, the PA gets to inspect them over a certain period of months or whatever. But, um, but I guess my understanding was at the time this guy was telling me this, that the Knicks are such a cozy organization with owning MSG and the cable company that they're like inauditable or no one believes it. So they just use the Lakers numbers. Have you ever heard this? I think that's in the CBA. I don't know the yeah. specifics of it, but I'm fairly certain that the Knicks and the Lakers have some um, special accommodation that relates specifically to them. Yeah. Um, but I don't, I don't know, but that is in the CBA. I, I believe, I believe. Yeah, I that's great. That's pretty cool. Well, what's look, your favorite? Like what's right the, wait, sorry, go ahead. Oh no, look, it's, it's, it is an incredibly difficult, you're basically creating a regulated economy, right? You're creating, you know, you're, 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 you're creating an economy and you're creating a mechanism of the rules that, that, that govern that, which is incredibly difficult to do. Um, and then you're doing it from a circumstance, not of, you know, political parties negotiating, but of a union and an employer. Um, and so it isn't the same, first of all, it isn't, it, 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 it can be the same level of power, um, but it isn't always, and it isn't often. And so I, 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 I think that it's, it's interesting, you know, to see how they do that. I think it's difficult to do. Is it like, were they brilliant? Like, did they do things that 
were visionary that really were, have proven to work have worked well? Um, I think I, first of all, I think I think both Stern and Fleischer were brilliant. I think they were absolutely brilliant. I think I think Fleischer. I think Fleischer was incredibly creative and incredibly innovative. And I think that certain things like the, and he, and he, had, he, had, he had guts. I mean, the idea of being like, we're going to sue the NBA, right? We're going to get, every, and I'm going to get every single one of your stars to sign on, right? It takes real guts and it takes real creativity to say, hey, you, your league is struggling, right? We're going we're gonna, to, you had this cable revenue. You had this MSG and, and the part about MS, the MSG network that blew up, but they had no idea it was going to happen, right? He says, you know, this new revenue stream, we want a piece of it and we're going to sue you to get it. Right. You know, it takes tremendous courage and tremendous confidence and tremendous institutional memory and tremendous faith of the player. So Fleischer, and first of all, you know, you'll see in the book that Fleischer wanted TV revenues for 20 years. I mean, Fleischer wanted this for a long period of time. You know, when they, when, when, when the NBA went to CBS in the early seventies, he took the players off the air he wouldn't let them, the, the players agreed. I mean, it wasn't, he said, you're going out, but they weren't on the air for weeks until they negotiated a deal to have them pay for it. So, you know, I think, so on the one hand, yes, they were absolutely visionary and they were absolutely brilliant. Um, and Stern was brilliant, right? So some of the stuff that I talk about is Stern is negotiating for cable deals in the mid 1970s. David Stern is going to HBO. He's going to ESPN. They don't call it ESPN. They call it ESP because they didn't know what to call it then. And Stern is negotiating. <laughs> it's true. Stern, Stern reaches an agreement to give ESPN free, um, free highlights in exchange for, you know, th there's a trade that they go to. He is the one who is trying to make sure that, that, that um, uh, control is centralized in the league office, right? There used to be highlight films that would go and be unopened, right? He wanted that centralized in the team office. He wanted to make sure the broadcasts were uniform. Um, you know, so all of these things, you know, they were certainly visionary. They were seeing international players, right? Fleischer leaves the PA in the late 1980s to go to be an agent full time. And his view is, I've been traveling all over the world. He used to go on yearly trips with the union. I've gone to the Soviet Union. I've gone to, and I saw Arvidas Sabonis and, and, and Sarunas Marshallonis. And he negotiated a deal with the USSR to bring them to the NBA. When he dies in 1989, he's negotiating for Vladi Divac to come to, 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 to the NBA, right? So there's tremendous vision and tremendous brilliance. Is it a master plan? No, I don't think it is, right? So the other piece of it is, that, that, you know, they're negotiating this stuff. On two occasions, Larry Fleischer is willing to give them a hard cap. On two occasions, David Stern says no, right? Um, uh, there's all of these, you know, uh, there are all of these aspects as to how they do it. You know, there's, there's vision, yes. I mean, the other thing is that in terms of, I know we can get to other stuff, and I apologize for kind of getting derailed by, by some of this stuff, but, you know, when they're working on these things, it's like a constitutional convention. Right when you're looking at how they're building the economics of sports for all sports, not just the end, like this period from the 70s to the to the 80s, you didn't know, right? There were kind of the system where the owners are in full control, and then it's kind of shifting. And, and so when you look at how they built this stuff, you know, the, the proposal that the owners put forth in the late 1970s is that okay, we're going to have an 11 person committee determine what every player is worth, right? That's something they put forward. They put forward, you know, but the proposal that they had, a friend of mine said to me, he's like, I can't believe they had the stretch provision. In 1979, it was a proposal that they had. And so like, and, and then when you look at these memos that are going back and forth to, to Stern as they're formulating what they want to propose, you know, it, it's, it's, it's really interesting to see how they do it. Um, so on the one hand, is their vision, is their brilliance? hundred percent. Was it a master plan? No, not really. Not in the way that we want to believe it is. They had a stress provision in 1979 and the games were tape delayed Friday night at 1130. That was the, when you could watch the NBA. Because yep. I used to watch it. Yep. Tape delayed, eleven thirty Friday nights. They also stretched that. They stretched when the game was. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> right. True. And, and Crazy. There, I there is a a, a telex because they use telex. Yeah. I don't know what telex yeah. are. But there is a telex from Larry O'Brien to every owner before I think it was Game Seven of the nineteen eighty NBA Finals, begging them to push their local CBS affiliates mm -hmm. to run Game Seven of the NBA Finals. Jeez. Wow. Um. Maybe. Is it a little weird that it's like white guys in the back room deciding the salaries of maybe the most important avenue for riches for young black men? Like, yeah, I mean, you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, look, you know, 
Is it is it a little odd to have a, a, a cover that has, you know, two old white guys and say they built the NBA? Um, <laughs> yeah, just, you know, like, that's a chance for me to hold the cover up again. There you yes. go. There you um, go. And, and, and that was actually why I wrote they built the modern NBA. I think, you know, um, I, look, I, I think that, I, and I think that's a reasonable question. And I think that, you know, part of, both Larry Fleischer and Stern talk extensively about racism. They didn't shy away from it. Um, and I think that Fleischer, you know, look, Fleischer didn't shy away from it. He didn't push, you know, he, he would be public, um, but he didn't shy away from the idea that, that you know, there, there was racism. Um, he was, you know, but, and it was also important to him that, that the leadership of the union reflected the players, right? It was important, you know, when Tommy Heinsohn retired and Oscar Robertson took over, you know, it was important to everyone that there be an African-American head of the union because that was reflective of what the players were. And that's what happened, right? Now, that was what happened between, between Robertson and then, and then um, Robertson and then Silas and then basically every, every president of the NBPA since. And then every executive director after Fleischer. And one of the reasons that I was told that part of the reason why he left was that he thought it might be time for there to, have, to be an African-American executive mm -hmm. director of the union. And so I, I think that that's true. And I think that that's a fair thing to think about. And I think it's a fair thing to talk about. Um, you know, I think that, I, I don't know that I agree that it's like two guys in a back room negotiating, right? I think that the NBPA, to its credit and to its, had incredible leadership. And I, I think that that can't be understated. I think that, you know, and, and I think even that they do now, right? I think Chris Paul looks a lot like, you know, uh, Lanier and, and, and Silas and Oscar. And, and I think that these were guys who had tremendous integrity and credibility and leadership. And I, I don't, I, you know, and, and, and it, when you read the negotiations, um, Fleischer, you know, Bill, Bob Lanier is there for negotiations. Junior Bridgman is there for negotiations. There's one case where like Bob Lanier, and the other thing that ended up happening is that the leaders who were the head of the union in the early days became execs, right? So Lenny Wilkins was, was involved in the 64 strike. He goes on the other side. Tommy Heinsohn, you know, if you read about, you know, the, the chapter about 1964 is that, you know, it seems like the ownership is very angry at him. He ends up going on the other side, you know, huge, huge, huge aspects of it. So then by 82, when um, Fred Brown is a vice president of the NBPA and he's showing up, you know, he's missing a game because he's in negotiations, which is incredible to think about. Right. Wow. Um, you know, the, the coach of the Seattle supersonics is Lenny Wilkins, whose agent was, was Larry Fleischer. So I think that he kind of built this tree wow. of leadership and, and of integrity um, and it was not, you know, it was not a circumstance in which he's kind of making these decisions in the back room. You know, you know, players had, it, it appears, right, the players had tremendous leadership, ownership, and, 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 and um, respect for Fleischer. Um, you know, the ownership side, yeah, is different, right? Ownership was all white, outside of Simon Gordine, who was the deputy commissioner for several years. Um, you know, and that was historically, as far as I know, I think until Bob Johnson, I think, was the first African-American owner in the NBA. But Why know. did Fleischer pass away? So he died in 1989. So yeah. he left the NBPA in 1988. And a lot of them, Oh, wow. He died yeah. a year later. He died a year later. And he died very young. And so I, I think that part of, you know, part of one of the other aspects of the book that I think is important, one of the reasons why I wrote it, is that, you know, there's a lot of talk in the NBA about legacy and like what everyone's legacy is. Yeah. And Larry Fleischer has an incredible legacy, right? And it's just not remembered. And it's not considered. And it's not thought about. And I think it's because he died young. And I think it's because it kind of shifted in a different way. And I think that, you know, when you look at baseball, you know, Marvin Miller, who I revere, I revere Marvin Miller. I love Marvin Miller. Um, is kind of a household name for sports fans. Whereas Larry Fleischer is, ah, he's just, do we not. know, do we know what players went to his funeral? Do you know his funeral? Yeah. Oh, Larry, Larry Fleischer. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Bill Bradley gave a eulogy. Oscar gave a eulogy. Oh, wow. Um, I think Lanier gave a eulogy. So that's I, how I mean, the one thing that I will, and I can, I can send it around if you guys want. He was their trusted attorney. He was, and he and he he did right by them. I mean, you know. Yeah, he earned it, right? He earned it. I mean, he, you know, look. There's something weird about the fact that he was a head of the union and an agent, right? That feels. And before I read more about it, it feels weird. But they all trusted him, and it's yeah. you know, and and he was, you know, um, and there's a great, you know, when he got into the Hall of Fame. And this is the very end of the book. I'm not trying to do it, but Bill Bradley, Larry Fleischer was Bill Bradley's agent. If Bill Bradley loves someone, I love someone, right? <laughs> and so, um, <laughs> That's awesome. But Bill Bradley says, I mean, Bill Bradley was the only presidential campaign I ever worked on. 
And wow. I didn't work on it. I gave up. Andy was a Nick. It's perfect. Andy was a Nick, right. Yeah. And I used to say it was because I liked his liberal policies. And my dad was like, you like him because he played basketball. Who yeah. <laughs> um, but but in, in, when he goes to the Hall of Fame, you know, Bill Bradley does his, his eulogy. And Bill Bradley, he said this at his funeral, which is that if the goal of the union is to, is to enrich his members, right? Larry Fleischer was the most successful union leader in the 20th century. And I think that by that, that standard is true, uh, you know, and, and so, um, yeah, so uh, that was my, awesome. we should, I, this time has flown. Um, Gerard, are you available? Usually, um, not usually as ironclad law. Um, yeah. the last question of every show is from Gerard Hector, who's also in Manhattan, although his background may look like Paris, um, and he'll be here. <laughs> not and today. Is, not Paris? No Paris today. Back, back in New York today. Got important things to do. Welcome home. <laughs> Um, this is awesome, uh, Josh, and actually I can't, I can't wait to read this book. Um, so, you know, we're in this period right now where I feel like we got to be radical, man. Let's blow things up and like do all this shit differently. Like these owners that we have now, a lot of them, you're, I mean, the way they talk and comport themselves are like masters of the universe, right? Like, but yet everything like that they do is about protecting themselves from themselves, right? And all these terrible mistakes they make and you know, we got to have caps on salaries, whatever. In your mind, what would it look like if the NBA had a true free open market system similar to what we have in European football, right? If you want to spend $500 million on your top four guys, well, that's on you. Like, you do what you want to do. If you think you – whatever the situation be, what do you think that could possibly look like? Well, I mean, first of all, I, I you know, and, and I wrote this – in the beginning of the book in the introduction, which is that I don't believe that there's any need for a salary cap in 2020. I don't think that that's a spectacularly crazy position to take. It seems like you have an incredibly smart group of people in every front office in the NBA and why not let them compete in a market the way anybody else would. Right. I don't, I don't think that that's a, a, a crazy thing to say. Um, the one thing that I, I found to be incredible about the time period that's in this book is that Drud, what you're describing is kind of the chaos that existed. Right. In 1988, you know, the, uh, you know, it's a little bit after this, the union said, okay, you want to, you know, we tried to negotiate for a salary cap. We want to get rid of it. The owners won't agree to it. What we're going to do is we're going to decertify the union. And this is a term that has, has been a very relevant thing. And I put this in there. And, and first of all, this is beyond, beyond radical, right? What Fleischer says is we're going to decertify the union that we think that all of these things are violations of antitrust law and which they are right. The NBA is a, is a legal monopoly. Um, we think that all of this violates antitrust law and we're going to decertify the union because we think that we're just going to have every, any, there's a quote in the book from Fleischer saying every kid coming out of college is going to send you a letter saying, I will negotiate with any one of you who wants to sign me. Right. You know, I look, I think that we, you know, there's this um, other fear, right? There's this fear and, and I don't mean to quit quote on Fleischer because I got, but Fleischer was amazing and he was brilliant and he was amazing. But Fleischer said that, that, um, all changes objected to on the theory that it will destroy, right? And in 1973, right, they went to him and they said, well, if there's free agency and if you win the Robertson case, then there will be chaos in the NBA, right? There won't be competitive balance. What are we ever going to do? And Fleischer basically says, you know, all changes objected to on the theory that it will destroy, right? Why don't you see what happens? Why don't, why don't you see what the circumstances are? Um, and, you know, it's the kind of thing where you're, you're begging for competitive balance. The truth of the matter is that the Celtics won from 1960 to 1969. You're asking for a system that never really existed. Um, but the other side of it is that, look, the, the system that Fleischer agreed to was a pragmatic system. And I think there was more than a logical reason for him to do so. And I was surprised by that. I will tell you that I, I was surprised to come to that conclusion, but when you read about it, you kind of do. Um, but yeah, I don't see, you know, I, I don't, I don't, I think that it, it's totally reasonable for, um, you know, the NBA remains a legal sanctioned monopoly. Uh, and so, What's the, you know, the union has tools at, it, at its disposal, should it choose to, to do so. And granted, all of this law has shifted dramatically. So I'm not trying to say that, you know, this law has shifted dramatically. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that that would look like what the NBA did in 1988. Now, the NBA got scared and reached a deal. Because <laughs> ultimately, right, what you're, the teams still have to be smart, right? I mean, like, you just because I want to spend whatever I can spend, you still got to be somewhat intelligent with how you spend your money or else, all right, I spent the billion dollars on a roster. They suck. Like, it happens. Don't rip on the Knicks. He loves the Knicks. <laughs> yeah, that's, you know, but you can step in up in a hurry if you're not careful. Well, um, that's, I, I mean, yeah, sorry. No, I just, 
the other ironclad rule of the show is that if we go over, Judy gets really mad. And so oh, right. we're getting awfully close to that. So let me uh, wrap it there. Thank you so yeah. much. She does. She says in the chat. This is the book. It's amazing. It really is. Josh, thank you so much. Uh, Gerard, David, thanks a lot, guys. Thank you so Great much for having me. me. Take care, guys.